Welcome back to the MMA meeting. Let's talk with the Weasel Podcast where we talk all things MMA. One prospect that looked really good two fight cards ago was Joe Pfeiffer. Joe Pfeiffer is a middleweight prospect that the division needs right now. He's an actual well-rounded middleweight. There's very few of those kind of guys in the middleweight division. Most guys are doing one or two things. Joe Pfeiffer showed good wrestling in that fight, although he was fighting Abdul Razak Al-Hassan and he was bigger than him. It's not that Abdul is that small. He's kind of small for a middleweight, but Joe Pfeiffer especially looks huge for this weight class. He shot immediately in the fight, started striking with him, landing good shots, big, big takedowns, man, and then choked him to sleep with an arm triangle showed many different facets of his game that prove him to be a very promising fighter rising up in this division he's only like what 27 years old I'm very happy to see a guy like Joe Pfeiffer at middleweights because man that division needs guys like him he's good on the mic too he's very honest pretty well spoken this guy's a very exciting prospect man in other news we also have Henry Cejudo versus Marab Davalashvili that's getting targeted so the fight is not 100% confirmed yet but I'm glad to see that Marab is actually going to take a fight I mean he should be the guy that, that fights Sean O'Malley but the fact that they're going this route means now one of the three options for a title fight is gone for the moment Marab is not getting a title shot he's probably going to be fighting Cejudo. And he also did say the other day that he does accept it. So verbally, it does seem to be set. They just have to get both guys to agree on paper. Aljamain Sterling and Cheeto are now the two guys that might get a rematch with Sean O'Malley. The more time passes, the more I think they might go with Aljamain. But the green paper points to Cheeto. I think Cejudo versus Marab is a very good fight. Both guys are probably the best wrestlers in the weight class. We still gotta see what Umar does against the elites of the division. They both have a completely different style of wrestling. Marab will be extremely consistent with his shots. He's gonna be shooting a lot, trying to attach to Cejudo, and constantly ride him out. Cejudo, on the other hand, is a kind of fighter that will just shoot for takedowns when he creates or sees the opening for them. He's not too consistent with shooting takedowns throughout fights. There's been many fights where he struck a lot more than he wrestled. With Marab, it's almost never that way. Only a couple fights where he was striking a lot, but he has most of his success when he's constantly shooting at you all the time, non-stop. Cejudo might be one of the harder guys for Marab to take to the ground because number one, of course, the wrestling pedigree from Cejudo is at the absolute highest level. But number two, Cejudo's shorter than him. We do know it's harder to shoot under shorter fighters. They have a much lower center of gravity. They're able to sprawl much faster. And Cejudo just generally being faster than Marab, he should be able to defend most of the takedowns. The only thing he has to worry about, though, is getting Marab off of him from clinching up against the fence because Marab is going to be the bigger, stronger guy, most likely. Cejudo is pretty strong, but Marab is definitely going to be bigger than him. So he might push him up using his size to hold Cejudo up against the fence. I mean, he was able to do it against Jose Aldo, who is one of the biggest bantamweights. I'm pretty sure he can do the same to Cejudo. So if Cejudo learns from that fight with Jose Aldo, he should find a way to get away from Marab and the cage itself to keep the fight striking as much as possible. As long as the fight stays striking, Cejudo has the advantage here. He hits way harder. He's way faster. He's way more precise with his punches. He's not as sloppy. Way cleaner with everything he does. Technically the overall better striker in almost every single department. He clears the striking game. And we do know that Cejudo is very good at timing the knee, which he did against Dominic Cruz, if the opponent lowers their posture. So I actually do think if we see a prime Cejudo or a Cejudo that's in very good shape, he can absolutely be a nightmare for Marab. The same narrative was said about Cejudo's fight with Eljo, but Eljo had something that Marab doesn't, reach. Marab is going to have a harder time finding a way from Cejudo's punching range than Eljo did. Eljo did a pretty good job of using his range against Cejudo in the stand-up, or a Cejudo that's in very good shape. He can absolutely be a nightmare for Marab, but Marab does have a strength and consistent, frustrating wrestling style that can literally beat everybody in this weight class. It just depends who can answer this. Who can, Who's going to be the guy that finally answers this Marab puzzle? We have other fight news. Derek Lewis steps in to fight Jelton Almeida because Blades pulled out. So Lewis is either going to get strangled in 30 seconds or he's going to land a miraculous punch and knock out Almeida. Derek Lewis did knock out Curtis Blades going for a takedown. He could probably do the same against Almeida who has a routine of the way he fights. If you actually noticed, Jelton Almeida starts every single one of his fights the exact same way. He comes out there throws a front kick, then shoots. He does it every time. Every single one of his UFC fights have started this way. If Derek Lewis has studied his opponent, or hopefully his coaches have at least, he would know what Jelton Almeida is going to do if he throws the front kick first. He throws a front kick, he's going to dive in for the takedown. If Derek Lewis can time the uppercut, he could literally get like a five to seven second knockout here. If he doesn't time it, 
he's gonna most likely get taken to the ground and submitted. Derek Lewis is the master of the get up technique, just get up, but it's different when you fight a guy who actually has good jiu-jitsu. Most of the guys he stood up against don't really have great jiu-jitsu. Almeida is very fast and more nimble than most other heavyweights, so he should be able to get his back if Derek Lewis tries to stand up. All the other heavyweights are very unathletic compared to this guy, so Lewis had more success against those fighters. With Almeida, though, it should be a completely different thing where Lewis should not be able to just stand up. If he just stands up against Almeida, that technique may be just too overpowered for MMA. Man, I am so excited for this weekend's card. UFC 294 is going to be insane, man. There's a lot of people saying that the card looks better now than it did before. I could agree with that, but man... Volk without a training camp, if he gets ragdolled out there and submitted quickly or something, you know, like if he, if he doesn't really perform well, it's going to make a lot of people wish that he had at least a training camp, but he took the fight regardless, you know, there could be no excuses. He didn't need to take this fight on short notice. He could have waited for his shot after the Taporia fight. He could have got a full training camp if he gets past Taporia, that is. He can get a full training camp against Islam and then also have the fight promoted better, more time for everything, press conferences, everything involved, you know, but he didn't want to do that. He wanted to take this fight on short notice. He believes he's going to beat Islam, so there can be no excuses as to him losing this fight, regardless of how it ends. Logically speaking, Islam should beat Volk easier than last time. I mean, he's going into this fight with many more advantages than he did before. A lot of people don't want to talk about that. Islam had a lot of disadvantages the first time they fought each other. I don't know why a lot of people are overlooking the importance of rehydration. There is no way on this earth that Islam and Volk weigh the same without Islam being compromised. They were both the same weight in the cage the first time they fought each other. And we do know the fighters had 24 hours to rehydrate, not the usual 36 hours. 12 hours extra, a 33% increase in a rehydration period is so significant especially for a big guy like Islam. There is an argument that, you know, he's too big for lightweight. He should just go up to welterweight. I agree with that as well. I don't like guys who are cutting too much weight to be bigger than everybody else. I wish everybody fought closer to their natural weight. I don't like that whole thing, but this is what the game is at the end of the day. So with Islam being smaller than usual, we do know he's between like 175 and 180 with a good weight cut and rehydration. Him being like 171, 172 against Volk is absurd. Five pounds is big, man, especially at the highest level of the game. Five pounds can make a big difference. It's literally half a weight class apart. And he could even be up to 180. I wouldn't be surprised if Islam goes into the fight at 180. But I'm expecting to be like 177-ish, maybe. With him being smaller against Volk, he's also going to be physically weaker than usual. He's not going to have as good cardio. He's still going to feel some of the effects of the weight cut. He's not going to take a punch as well. And he had to travel to his opponent's home. Now, Volk is going to travel to Islam's home with disadvantages on his side. I would even argue, actually not even an argument, it's factual. He has more disadvantages than what Islam had the first time. The guy doesn't have a training camp at all. He's most likely not in his best shape. He had an injury like two months ago and he was recovering for like six weeks after. There's no way he's in the best shape. He's probably in good shape, but not in the best. There's no way it's impossible. For anybody that knows anything about training or fighting, there's no way Volk is at the best shape he can be in. I mean, there was pictures of him actually. He shared a picture of him in training like a couple days ago or yesterday or something he does not look as good as he did the first time physically he does not objectively speaking he doesn't he looks a little bit fatter not nearly as lean as he was before now what that can spell is he looks like he's a little bit bigger so he might hit harder but his cardio might be lacking compared to before he may be slower but he also might take a punch better which tells you that volk would probably want to win this fight earlier than usual he probably wants to knock out islam sooner rather than later he also has to take that flight to abu dhabi which is going to take away from that limited amount of time he already has from training he's going to be fighting a bigger and stronger islam than before Remember, these are not excuses if Volk loses. These are merely just pointing out the facts of the fight. There are no excuses that can be made from Volk. He took the fight knowing all of this, and he believes that he's ready. This isn't like he freakishly got injured in training camp or something. He's fully aware of all the elements of the fight. He's aware of all of this. Some people look at stuff like this where you start pointing out facts as, oh, you're, you're already making excuses, you're planting seeds, when that's not what's happening at all. We have to understand this fight and not be delusional, right? Factually speaking, Islam should beat Volk, and he should do it easier than he did before. And if he beats Volk, his last three wins will be against top five pound-for-pound -pound fighters. I don't think there's a fighter ever that has done that. And number two, he would have to go down as one of the greatest lightweights of all time. I wouldn't say number one. I don't know if I would say number two, but maybe like three or four. And the guy just pretty much started. You know, he pretty much just started at the top of the division. All the credit has to be given to Islam because he also is risking a lot here. 
It's not just Volkanovski that's risking. Islam has to change his training camp and focus from one opponent to another. That's a different dynamic from having no opponent and now focusing on one. Islam already had game plans and preparation for a certain opponent, but now he has to shift that to Volk. It's not going to be too difficult, of course, because they fought each other before. So the game plan and the mental part of the, the fight should be pretty good for both parties here. But Islam did not have to take this fight. He could have waited for Charles Oliveira. And he knows that Volk is going to come into this fight being dangerous, right? Volk is going to be a dangerous guy trying to knock him out. He's a very skilled fighter in general. Islam does not want to underestimate Volkanovski at all. Now, if Volk beats Islam, I mean, like top three greatest fighters of all time, coming off 11 days notice to beat one of the best fighters in the world. Like I said before, I don't think there's a fighter from welterweight and down that can beat Islam on short notice. And if Volk does it, becomes a two-weight world champion, he has to be like top three greatest fighters of all time, right? He has to be like right under, he has to be like maybe just under Demetrius Johnson, maybe on the same level. And then if he goes around and beats Ilya Tapuria two months later, he's my number one. Honestly speaking, if he beats Islam and Tapuria two months between each other, 11 days notice against Islam at a higher weight class, and then beats that third generation fighter in his own weight class, I consider him the greatest fighter of all time, without PEDs included. But Volk has to make the most of this, because if he loses to Islam, he's never getting a shot again. He is never going to fight Islam ever again. I was talking with one of my friends yesterday, and we were we were talking about the whole YouTube boxing scene. So obviously, very strange event. Comment event was crazy. That was so funny. It was the circus I thought it was going to be. The main event was also one of the worst boxing fights. It didn't really have any entertaining moments. At least Dylan Dennis shot for a takedown for a guillotine and the security got involved so there was something entertaining about that the main event there was like no entertainment at all these two guys hugged each other for six rounds they each landed like 30 punches still more than 16 from danis and the fight ended in a controversial decision where it seems like a lot of people believe that ksi should have won the fight which is crazy to think about that ksi made a fight with tommy fury competitive is that more embarrassing on tommy fury side or just boxing in general because Tommy Fury should have made that fight look easy. It's KSI, you know? KSI does have a very strange style, and it did seem like Tommy Fury didn't really know what to expect from it. He was backpedaling away from a lot of those shots and didn't know how to counter them effectively. That Michael Page bladed, bouncy style, throwing right hands from 10 miles away, but somehow closing that distance so quickly. KSI was replicating that style and actually being successful and making the fight competitive. Such a strange thing, man. I did see a uh, slim knockout Salt Poppy too. That was interesting. A lot of even boxing promoters are saying that Salt Poppy has legitimate talent to be an actual boxer and he got knocked out by Slim. The thing I was talking my friend about was how many fighters in the UFC's top 15 and middleweight and welterweight could Jake Paul beat in a boxing match? We were trying to figure out are UFC fighters in general just that bad in boxing? Or is just Jake Paul is that good compared to them? So let's go down the list here. If Jake Paul fought the middleweight division in boxing, so against Anthony Hernandez, he easily beats him, easily beats Andre Mooney's. Chris Curtis would be a good fight. I think Jake would eventually beat Curtis, but that's a very good fight. Beats Paul Craig. Okay, Nazardine Imovov should win, but I don't know if he would, realistically speaking. He has the skills and the striking ability to beat Jake Paul. But for some reason, I see him being very passive and losing that fight. So Nazardine could beat him. I just don't know if he would. I think Kelvin would lose. He gets hit too much. He's not that great of a pure boxer. Brandon Allen loses. Jack Hermanson loses. Roma Delize loses. I think Paulo Costa loses. He's a little too wild and he throws haymakers all over the place. He'll get bombed on by that right straight. Marvin Vittori loses. I think Jared Kennanier would probably win, but I don't know. I would go with Jared Kennanier. Robert Whitaker would win. Drickus, he's like the opposite of Nazardine. Just straight boxing. No jiu-jitsu, no kicks, no wrestling. Because Drake is very well-rounded. Just his pure boxing technique. He should not beat Jake. But he's the kind of guy that would probably beat him. Adesanya would win. And Strickland would win. Strickland would destroy Jake Paul. So he beats the majority of the top 15 at the middleweight division. But there are some like... Chris Curtis and Nazardine would be tough fights. Paulo Costa would be kind of tough. I think Kennedyer, Whitaker, Drickus, Adesanya, and Strickland would probably win. So the top five guys, including the champion. Now the welterweight division. Jake Paul beats Michael Chiesa destroys Neil Magny. That would be so easy for him. I think he beats Kevin Holland. Jack Della Maddalena. I think, I think Jack should win. I'll go with Jack. I think he beats Ian Gary. Too much pressure. Ian doesn't move his head enough. He beats Vicente Luque. He gets hit too easily. He beats Sean Brady. I think Jeff Neal would beat him. I think Wonderboy would destroy him. I think Shafkat will lose. He gets hit too easily without his jiu-jitsu and kicks. I think Gilbert Burns loses. I think Hamzat loses. I think Bilal Muhammad loses. I think Colby loses. I think Usman loses. I think Leon should win. Yeah, I think Leon should win. So he beats way more welterweights in a boxing fight. 
But that is crazy to think about that he would beat the majority of the top 15 of both welterweight and middleweight in a boxing match. The hardest fight for him would probably be Adesanya and Strickland. You also have Wonderboy and Jeff Neal, right? Those two guys would be extremely difficult for him. When we talk about what if scenarios in MMA, we often bring up Zabit as the biggest what if. What if I were to tell you that there's arguably an even bigger what if than Zabit? I was thinking about this the other day. What if Yoel Romero came into MMA after winning silver at the 2000 Olympics at 23 years old. When you really think about it, that 23-year-old Yoel Romero, not 35-year-old that we saw in the UFC, at 23 years old, Yoel Romero could have gone down as one of, if not the greatest fighter of all time for the destruction he lay in his path and what he would have achieved. This is not exaggerating. He could have absolutely won the belt and defended it nearly 20 times before ever losing. A lot of that has to do with the middleweight division being so weak throughout its history. But the numbers this young monster would have accumulated would never be touched. People don't realize how much later Anderson Silva came into the UFC. He made his UFC debut in 2006. Yuel would have won the belt in 2001, maybe early 2002, and defended for four or five years before he ever fights Anderson Silva. In that amount of time, he could already add up 7 to 10 title defenses. Anderson would be a tough fight, but arguably he could beat Anderson and then fight the other lower level guys that Anderson beat. We're talking about Telus Latis and all these other guys, right? Potentially, it would have taken all the way till 2013 or even 15, if you look at the Wyman and Whitaker eras, before Yuval Romero would ever lose. At least 12 years as a champion is unheard of. And that's what a young, fresh off his wrestling career, pre-neck injury, Yoel Romero could have done. People don't know this about Yoel. When we saw Yoel Romero at 35 years old make his UFC debut, it was post-neck injury. You guys see that scar on the back of his neck? Yeah, he had a pretty bad neck injury, and that really hurts your ability to wrestle. It may be a big reason as to why Yoel did not wrestle that much throughout his UFC career. Because in 2011, he injured that neck. Can you imagine Yoel younger, even admitted by him, more athletic, stronger, and faster when he was younger. Pre-neck injury coming off his wrestling career, this guy would have been unstoppable. He did not start MMA after the Olympics of the year 2000. And he continued to wrestle for like five, six years after, right? And that's why he started MMA so late. He actually got into the UFC when he was already in his 30s. And everybody knew about Yoel Romero back then when he was young in wrestling that he was even stronger, faster, and more athletic than when we saw him in MMA. Do you know how crazy that is to imagine? That Yoel was even scarier. He was more of a freak when he was in his 20s. I mean, this guy's moving insanely well, even in his 40s. He still looks freakishly athletic. And he even said when he was in his 20s, it was a whole different game, man. He was a completely different beast in his 20s. And you can see his wrestling matches. The guy was physically strong, man. It just does not make sense. Imagine that Yoel Romero in his early to mid-20s going into MMA, let's say around 2001. This may seem far-fetched, but I believe if Yoel did that, he could have possibly broken every title record that there is right now. Because who would have beaten him? The only guy I could think of that can do something to him is probably Anderson Silva and nobody else. Maybe Jacare if he was able to get in there during that time. Maybe that would have been an interesting fight. We do know that Yoel and Jacare had a close fight when they fought each other. Yoel Romero would have decimated Rich Franklin and every single fighter during that era before Anderson came into the scene. And even when Anderson was champion, there is not a single fighter during that entire run that would have beaten Yoel Romero. I think you all have absolutely destroyed every single one of Anderson's opponents. We're talking about Yushin Okami. We're talking about Damian Maya, Telus Latis, Rich Franklin, even Vitor Belfort before TRT, Dan Henderson. I don't think any of these guys would have beaten Yoel Romero. And you would have to imagine that Yoel would wrestle a lot more coming freshly off his wrestling career. Anderson Silva is the only guy I believe that could have given him any kind of issue. But then again, Anderson didn't do well against Chael Sonnen. In fact, he didn't fight a lot of wrestlers. He fought two wrestlers before he lost to Chris Wyman. Those were Chill Sonnen and Dan Henderson. Dan Henderson was a Greco-Roman wrestler that didn't use it too much. He did take Anderson down, actually, which is pretty interesting. Actually won the first round because of the takedown. And then he got hurt in the second round, panic shot, and got choked out. 
Chael Sonnen, on the other hand, nearly beat Anderson Silva in that first fight. It's just that Chael had a big weakness to triangle chokes. He had a triangle weakness even before he fought Anderson Silva. He was getting submitted by that move by many other guys before he fought Anderson. Anderson just capitalized on something that was already a weakness. Yoel Romero never really had a weakness when it came to submissions. Even looking at what he did against Jacare Souza when he was in Jacare's guard, he defended everything. Jacare was attacking off his back. He was jumping for arm bars, for triangle chokes. Nothing was sticking. Yoel defended every single submission attempt from a guy like Jacare, who's one of the greatest Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu artists. And the other thing is, Yoel's also a much better wrestler than Chael was. He's also way stronger, he's way faster. And here's the other thing too, I'm pretty sure Yoel would have absolutely got Anderson to the ground. Anderson didn't have like great takedown defense against good wrestlers. He had good takedown defense against guys like Stefan Bonner and Damian Maya. That's why his takedown defensive rate is so high. It's like over 70%. It's because he defended these guys' takedowns, not Chael's takedowns for an example. You guys remember how many times Chael hit Anderson with ground and pound? The amount of shots he hit Anderson with while he was on top of him would have been a completely different story if that was Yoel landing those shots. I think if Yoel lands those same ground and pound shots on Anderson, that fight does not make it past the second round. Chael never finishes anybody with ground and pound. We saw what Yoel did to Lyoto when he got him on the ground. It was an instant knockout. A few elbows and Lyoto was out cold. It wasn't even a TKO. It was a KO. That's the kind of power this guy has. He's one of the most powerful fighters in middleweight history. Chael, I love Chael, but he has pillow hands. It's always been known. If Yoel gets Anderson in those same kind of positions and lands the same ground and pound shots that Chael did, that fight ends by a knockout. So then how far does Yoel go? Let's say he gets past Anderson. Does he clear the Weidman era? You know, Chris Weidman, Luke Rockhold, Michael Bisping, Jacare Souza. Does he clear these guys too? I mean, we saw what he did to Weidman and Rockhold later, and he did also beat Jacare. I can't imagine Michael Bisping would beat him. If he can get past the Weidman era, I think he will lose in the Whitaker era, of course, which came after. That's like 2015-ish. The Wyman era was in 2013. And I absolutely do think that you all would have came into the UFC within like one or two years after making his MMA debut because, number one, the UFC roster was a lot smaller and they were looking to recruit more fighters. Number two, the middleweight division was very shallow in the early and mid-2000s. They needed more fighters and you all remember will be coming off as a silver medalist in the Olympics. They would absolutely want someone like him in there because he actually made his UFC debut for his sixth professional fight. Yeah, his sixth professional fight was where he made his UFC debut. I believe in the early 2000s, he'd probably make his UFC debut in like his third or fourth fight. Like, let's go down history. Who would have Yoel fought at the time? Let's say he goes in the UFC by 2001. The champion at the time was Dave Manet. He gets slaughtered. Then in Marilla Bustamante. Good on the ground, dangerous with his grappling, but he gets destroyed. He can't get the fight to the ground, he'll get beat up on the feet. Then you have guys like Matt Lindland, David Terrell, Evan Tanner, Rich Franklin, Nate Quarry, David Lawazu. And by the time he would fight Anderson Silva in 2006, right after Anderson made his UFC debut against Chris Lieben, you will already have like seven title defenses. And I think he would beat Anderson, but that would be the most difficult matchup, especially at that day, without you all having... Some of the more advanced techniques that he displays today, but he will still have the flying knee. He'll still throw out some crazy athletic kicks. He'll have a lot of power, and I think ultimately, off of a fresh wrestling career, which hurt his wrestling later on, a younger, healthier, more athletic, faster Yoel Romero, I think would have beaten Anderson Silva in that day. So that would be like eight title defenses right there by 2006. And then he would have to fight Travis Luter, Nate Marquardt, maybe Rich Franklin again. Dan Henderson. Dan Henderson will make his UFC debut after being that dual weight champion in Pride. That would be a very interesting and difficult matchup for Yoel Romero, I believe. But let's say he gets past Dan Henderson too. Then you got Patrick Cote, Talos Latis, Damian Maya, Chael Sonnen, Vitor Belfort before TRT, where he was pretty much just boxing and jiu-jitsu. I don't know if he would have fought Yushin Okami back then. Yushin Okami had that Anderson fight because he did technically beat him by disqualification before and then we go into the Weidman era Weidman fights Yoel Romero with his first championship fight and maybe he would have beaten Yoel at that time if he gets past Weidman then he would have to fight Leota Machida maybe Vitor for the second time and then Luke Rockhold and after that we go into the Whitaker era Yoel Romero could literally have 20 title defenses logically speaking if he were to have went to the UFC after the Olympics 20 title defenses in a row and it's not even out of the realm of possibility either. Yoel could have beaten every single one of these guys. A few dangerous matchups. I would say Anderson Silva would be a difficult one. Dan Henderson would be difficult. Wyman and Rockhold will also be very difficult as well. And then Whitaker, I think that's where he would absolutely stop at. 
This is why it's one of the biggest what ifs in UFC history because if Yoel started MMA when he was young, he probably would be going down as the greatest fighter of all time because of the sheer amount of wins that he would stack up, the title defenses, the title wins. He would hold records that nobody would be able to touch. Now, a big factor for that is also that the middleweight division has never been too strong, right? Rich Franklin's and Anderson Silva's era was pretty weak, if we're going to be completely honest here. The strongest it ever was was like in the Whitaker and the Weidman era. And even during that time, it was good. It was good, but it wasn't like top notch, you know, it wasn't like like the lightweight division a couple years ago or the light heavyweight division back in the day when Chuck Liddell was around, Rampage, Shogun, all those guys. And the funny thing is, the best fighters during Weidman's era, Romero already beat him in reality. The only guy he didn't fight was Bisping. That is so crazy to think about. A young Yuval Romero, if he actually transitioned into MMA in the early 2000s, but the Romero that we got was the one that had his MMA debut in 2009, made his UFC debut in 2013 for his sixth professional fight. And he was already 36 years old by that time. When Yoel Romero made his UFC debut, he was 36 years old. He was way past his physical prime. We didn't see the absolute peak potential of Yoel Romero. Now, this is speculation to think that, oh, Romero is going to fight similar to how he fights now or how he fought like Lyoto, Jacques Ray later in his career. So, yes, a lot of those advanced techniques like the sidekicks to the knee and some of the crazy stuff that he throws probably would not be part of his arsenal. But I do think he would wrestle a lot more than he actually did later on because he'd be fresh off his wrestling career. He's younger without a neck injury and he was so insanely athletic. He would pick up things all over the place. The guy would learn extremely fast. And I absolutely do not see guys like Rich Franklin or anybody else during that era. Evan Tanner, Chris Lieben. I don't see any of these guys doing anything to you well. And with that, let's go right to the questions. We're going to start with the worst box. Hey Weasel, what are your thoughts on Usman Nurmagomedov? He's currently the Bellator lightweight champion, is currently undefeated, and his skills are insane. He's great at nearly everything. How do you see him doing against the top 15 of the UFC? Also, love your videos, man. Thank you so much. If he was in the UFC, he would still be one of the best. He has insane grappling skill comparable to like Islam and Habib. He has very good striking. A lot of people even credit his striking higher than the other Dagestanis in the lightweight division. He has an insane question mark kick. He's very, very fast. He also has really good vision on seeing everything coming and picking out the openings of his opponent. If he fought the top 15 of the lightweight division, I think he beats Drew Dober very easily, actually. He beats Matt Frivola, Hanato Moicano, Bobby Green, Jalen Turner, RDA, Dan Hooker. I think he beats Armin. Rafael Fazeev would be an interesting fight because of the takedown defense. And Fazeev is a better striker. But if it's a five-round fight, I easily go with Usman. If it's a three-round fight, it could be up in the air because of the stylistic matchup. I would ultimately pick Usman if it's five rounds. I think he beats Gamrot. He's a better grappler overall. And he's a better striker, I believe. He beats Michael Chandler. He's too smart. I think he beats Benil Dariush, but that would be an interesting fight because Dariush is really good on the ground. I think he beats Dustin Poirier. He submits Justin Gaethje. Oliveira's a tough one to call. I think because of Oliveira's experience and the fact that Usman is only 25 years old, which is crazy to think about, I think Oliveira would beat him. But in the future, when Usman goes into his prime, which he's not at right now, when he's in his prime, late 20s, early 30s, I don't think Oliveira would beat him. And then I think Islam would beat him. Very good for a 25-year-old man. To be able to beat almost everybody in the top 15 is remarkable. They go to Marsa Fiani. Hey Weasel, seeing how dominant Strickland looked against Adesanya, how would you see a rematch between Strickland and Pereira going? Also, the way Gan looked last fight, how would you see Gan versus Pavlovich? Keep up the good stuff. Thank you so much for the question, man. I don't see Strickland beating Pereira. I think Strickland specifically has a harder time against power punchers. This was shown in the Pereira fight. This was shown in the Cannoneer fight. And Pereira is on a similar kind of striking skill level as Adesanya. But with the fact that, n number one, his style is a little bit different, of course. But he has so much more power. And I think regardless, even if Strickland is able to defend some punches here and there... I think the leg kicks are still going to cause a lot of damage. I think Pereira is still going to catch him with some really good punches. Even though Strickland might land more output, I think Pereira's punches are going to cause way more damage. So I would see Pereira winning this again. And as for Gon versus Pavlovich, I think it's a tough fight for Pavlovich, man. I think Gon is just a little too technical. We haven't seen Pavlovich go up against a different kind of striker than... Derek Lewis and Taito Ivasa that's in the top 10. So he especially does well against guys so far that are willing to trade with him. And even Curtis Blades, who isn't that great at striking, not nearly as good as Gon, but he's the kind of guy that doesn't sit in your face 
throwing bombs, right? He was jabbing Pavlovich in the face. He was playing a little bit more of a distance game, using his speed and movement and stuff. That was giving Pavlovich a little bit of an issue in that first round. He was getting hit a lot. And I think Surreal Gun could build upon that and outstrike Pavlovich, evading all of his big shots and countering him effectively. The thing that Pavlovich would have to do is take the fight to the ground. So we haven't seen too much of it. But if Pavlovich can get Gan to the ground, things could be very interesting. Now, Cyril Gan did say he worked a lot on his grappling since the John Jones fight. So we don't know exactly where that's at either. But I would say, off of what we know of the two fighters, I would pick Cyril Gan. I think his jazz from both stances will be landing on Pavlovich, drawing out some of those big counter punches, and then countering with his hooks, letting good front kicks to the body to keep him away a little bit, conditioning him for the head kicks, and being in motion the whole time. Gan could be in trouble if he's backed up to the cage and Pavlovich is cutting him off. Because Pavlovich has a very long reach. He could intercept those angles a lot better than the other heavyweights. And we know Surreal Gan likes to move out on these angles when he's pressured. And if anybody can intercept him on those, it would be Pavlovich. But I would pick Gan at the end of the day. Then we get to Nick Beattie. Laura Sanko is growing into one of the best commentators in the business. If she were to permanently replace one of the other commentators, who would you choose? Also, who's got the belt at middleweight one year from now? Love you. Thank you so much for the question, man. I do agree. Laura Sanko is one of my favorite commentators as well. She's very knowledgeable in the sport. You can tell she's very passionate. She calls out things as they happen in a more technical manner. The only thing she's lacking is the entertainment part, right? The excitement. And you could tell from the pay-per-view card that she commentated. She even drew back that a lot. She didn't talk as much as usual. I don't know exactly what that could be. Is it because of her voice? Is because, you know, maybe a lot of people don't want it. I think she even talked about it. Like, people don't want to hear her raise her voice too high because it can be annoying or something like that. I think that's what she was saying. I could understand that sort of thing. It's like the opposite of Joe Rogan these days, right? Joe Rogan is the excitement, the entertaining guy. But he's lacking a lot of the technical aspect compared to the other commentators like Laura Sanko these days. Or Dominic Cruz. Or Daniel Cormier when it comes to wrestling. Or Paul Felder. You know, these guys are much better when understanding the technical aspect of the sport. Whereas Joe Rogan looks like he's backing out from the commentating scene slowly he used to be way better than he is now if she were to replace one of the commentators who would i choose i already know who all you are going to choose you guys are all going to pick bisping no hard feelings but i might have to also agree with you guys on bisping i think bisping gets a little too much hate i kind of like when he commentates fight night cards and stuff it's almost became it's almost become a staple to hear his voice during fight nights but i think daniel cormier is pretty close the only reason why i'm not picking cormier is because he does have iconic moments when something crazy happens in a fight. And also, I do learn when he's talking about wrestling. He's actually the only commentator I learn anything from. And it's only when he's talking about wrestling. And who do I think will be the middleweight champion a year from now? Hamza. I think Hamza. But it's very hard to say because what if Usman beats him? If Usman beats him, then it's not going to be Hamza. Then with the Mike Griffith. If Conor McGregor can get his act together and start training seriously, do you think he becomes a champion at 170? You think he has a shot at the top five of the 170 pound weight class? If not, why? No, he's way too small. And because of how big he is, I mean, he's actually getting smaller. If you guys notice in his training, he's getting slimmer. He's getting smaller. It looks like he's trying to get ready for 155. At 170, he's too small. And even if he carried all that muscle, he'd gas out in a round. There's no way he lasts. He would have a lot of punching power. He'd be faster than most of those guys. He's a very good striker even still today. But there's no way he lasts. And Welterweight has some of the best wrestlers in the UFC. Then we've got the Chris Brewer. If you were Charles Oliveira's coach, what would your strategy be to beat Islam Makhachev? Well, they're not fighting right now, but I can only imagine they're going to fight next, if Islam beats Volk, that is. And it probably will happen pretty soon because Islam wants to stay active. And we know Oliveira wants to get right back in there and not waste that training camp. So I can imagine if Islam beats Volk and he doesn't get injured, I wouldn't be surprised if they have this fight in February. So what do I think the strategy for Oliver would be to beat Islam? It's the same as before. I made a breakdown of what Oliver has to do and it's the exact same thing. There is no difference because he did not fight that way at all when he went up against Islam. He has to be pressured from the outside, using his reach, probing with the lead hand to trap Islam's to dictate range for his own right, as well as using that to keep Islam on that distance the whole time. As soon as Islam crosses that imaginary line where their hands are touching, that's where Oliveira knows how to react. If it's a punch from Islam, he knows how to counter it. He could slip on the outside of it and counter with his own right, like he did against Benil Dariush. Or he could throw an uppercut just in case if Islam tries to use that straight left in order to transition into a takedown. And from there, he can catch him with the uppercut, or he could try to defend it, or attack him with a guillotine. And Charles Oliveira has one of the best guillotines in the sport. So a lot of stalking with the lead hand, a lot of pressure, jabs and power punches. Do not really throw too many kicks. If he's going to throw a kick, they should be head kicks. We saw the power that he's able to deliver on Benio Dariush 
with those head kicks. And it's going to be the same thing with Islam in the opposite stance. That open side is going to be ready for that. Maybe push kicks to the body can condition for a question mark. But I ultimately do think Oliver has to focus more on his hands. And use the kicks as a means of a surprise. Right? Don't really rely too much on those. So a lot of jabs from the outside with lead hand traps. Which is going to be a lot of lead hand activity. And then countering with his own right. Whenever Islam tries to do something to break the pressure. Whether it's throwing the left straight. Going for a takedown. Which are the main two ways that Islam would react in this manner. Then with the dev. What advice would you give Yuri in the stand-up if you were his coach against Pereira? You cannot make this clean. If if Yuri fights this clean, he's going to get annihilated. No way Yuri Prohaska has the striking skill to fight a clean kickboxing fight with Alex Pereira. So the game plan is very hard to come up with because of how unpredictable Yuri is. And I think that in general has to be his game plan. He has to be as unpredictable, as explosive and off-time Pereira as much as he can. It's hard to create an entire game plan around being unpredictable. So there has to be some aggression, but you have to be aware of the counter left hook of Pereira. Because honestly, on paper, I don't know how Yuri beats Pereira. The only reason anybody would ride with Yuri is based off the fact that Yuri can make anything happen. He could dart from a distance and catch Pereira with a right straight. That's the main way I can see him catching Pereira at distance. Maybe he brawls with Pereira. Maybe he makes it wild. Maybe he does something crazy out there, channels his blue chakra this time. I don't know. Yuri has to be as funky and unpredictable as possible to beat Pereira. And that's very hard to come up with a game plan around. I think you have to just allow Yuri to fight him. And in training camp, all you have to do is just mimic Pereira style with a guy about his size and allow Yuri to figure out things himself with the coach kind of just answering advice that Yuri would ask. That's the only way I could see this actually happening. Then we got the Daniel LaFille. How would Cruz, Aldo, Penn, GSP, Silva, and Velasquez do against the current top 10 of the divisions they reigned over in their prime? The divisional goats, right? At one point, they were considered that. So Velasquez in the heavyweight division, he would beat Derek Lewis. He would beat Jelton Almeida, striking overall, and I don't think Almeida could take it to the ground. He would beat Taito Ivasa. The wrestling's too much. He would beat Sergey Spivak pretty easily, I think. He would beat Alexander Volkov, but it would be a very tough fight. I think he beats Curtis Blaze because I think he's a better striker overall. But that's also a difficult fight for the fact that Kane did not have the best head movement. He would move his head a lot. So don't confuse active head movement with good head movement. That's not the same. Just because you're moving your head does not mean you're doing it well. And I think Curtis Blaze jabs and straight rights would catch Kane. Similar to the way that Fabrice Verdun was landing them. But I think Kane would win at the end of the day. I think Tom Aspinall beats him. Too dangerous on the ground if he gets taken down. And I think he's a better boxer than Kane. I think Stipe beats him. I think Sergey Pelvich knocks him out. I think he beats Cyril Gaon. The wrestling weakness is too much. But on the feet, Kane has nothing for Cyril Gaon. And then John Jones beats him. Anderson Silva versus the top 10 of the middleweight division. He beats Kelvin Gastelum, beats Brendan Allen, beats Jack Hermanson, beats Roman Delize, beats Paulo Costa. That would actually be a fantastic finish against Costa because of their styles. I think Marvin Vittori would be a tough fight for him. But I think he would land the majority of the damage. But tough fight. Jared Cannonier. I think Anderson would beat him. But that is a dangerous one. I think Robert Whitaker would win because of his well-roundedness. He would catch him with some things on the stand-up. Anderson's more dangerous than Adesanya was, but he's not as long and tall. So Whitaker wouldn't have to worry about that much reach and height compared to Adesanya. But also, I do think the mix-up with the wrestling and stuff would win Whitaker a decision. I think Drakus would beat him in a similar way. Anderson did much worse against wrestlers, or guys that were able to take him to the ground, and Drakus would be one of those guys with actual dangerous Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. A lot of power in the stand-up as well. He doesn't really do much to Anderson on the feet. I think he would win on the ground. I think Adesanya beats him. He's just like a, a bigger, taller, longer version of Anderson Silva. And Anderson didn't really do much when he was fighting someone who wasn't engaging. And we know Adesanya, because of his reach advantage, he doesn't have to engage at all on Anderson. It would be up to Anderson to get in on him. For the first time, Anderson would fight someone who's longer and taller than he is. And that would give a counter-striker like him an issue. And then Sean Strickland. I don't know, man. Strickland does pretty well against guys of that style. Some people may call this crazy, but I think Strickland would win. He is a hard guy to counter. He gives counter punches a hard time. He's so defensively sound. And we know Anderson would drop his hands, leave his chin up in the air and stuff like that. And you do not want to do that against a guy who's so fundamentally sound like Strickland. Strickland's not going to make mistakes like Forrest Griffin and Stefan Bonner did. These other guys that just did not know how to box. Strickland would be, by far, the best boxer. Anderson's never fought a guy in his prime, even close to Strickland's level of boxing. Not even the same realm. Most of those guys that he was fighting before were extremely wild bar brawlers. Strickland is a technical MMA boxer. Now, GSP in the top 10 of the welterweight division, he beats Vicente Luque, beats Sean Brady, beats Jeff Neal, beats Wonderboy because of the takedowns. Shavkat. 
stylistically, this is one of his toughest fights. Because can he take Shavkat down? If he does, is he in too much danger? He's smaller than Shavkat. All the striking offense from Shavkat can give him a lot of issues. And he could potentially even get out jabbed here and there. The only thing about Shavkat is he doesn't move his head. So he will get hit a lot. Especially from the jab from GSP. That's a very, very tough one to call. You know what? I'm going to go with Shavkat. I think he beats Gilbert Burns who's a little bit too chinny. He will get dropped eventually from those jabs. Doesn't move his head well against those either. And GSP legitimately has one of the greatest jabs ever shown. And he's very long with it too. Hamzat. I'm going to go with Hamza. He has the punching power to hurt GSP at any moment. He's probably the only guy that can outgrapple him overall. Stop the takedowns. He's also the biggest guy in the weight class. He's going to be stronger than GSP. That is probably GSP's toughest fight in the welterweight division. But Hamza's a middleweight now. I don't know why he's still ranked at welterweight. I think he beats Bilal Muhammad, but it could be a pretty difficult fight. Colby will be a tough fight for GSP, but I think GSP is just so much better of a striker, technically speaking. That's where he would win the fight. The wrestling would be overall canceled out. I think they can both take each other down, but I don't think either guy are going to get held down. I think Usman might beat him. He stops the takedowns. He has the power and the reach to really hurt GSP overall. It's a tough fight though. And then Leon Edwards, I'm going to go with GSP because of the wrestling and grappling difference. Striking wise, GSP does not have much of a chance against Leon. BJ Penn versus the top 10 of the lightweight division. This is not going to go well for BJ Penn. I think he loses the RDA. RDA is too big. He's too well-rounded. I mean, BJ Penn out of all these fighters has the most dated style. And the lightweight division is literally the strongest weight class in the UFC, arguably with bantamweight. It's too far back. BJ Penn is way too dated. So he loses the RDA. I think Dan Hooker's too tough and just comes back and brawls it out with him and wins. BJ Penn is more technical in the stand-up, and he's not going to get taken to the ground, but I think Dan Hooker is just way too durable and scrappy. I think Armin Sayukin would beat him, but it could be difficult if Armin takes it to the ground because of BJ Penn's Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I think Rafael Fazeev destroys him, absolutely annihilates him on the feet. I think Matush Gamrat wins a decision. It's a tough fight as well. Any wrestler that doesn't have like a lot of danger in their stand-up might have a pretty tough time with BJ Penn. So Gamrat is going to have a tough time, but I think he wins a decision. He's way bigger than Penn. Michael Chandler knocks him out. The size difference between them two, it is not right. They're about the same height, but Michael Chandler is four BJ Penns wide. Darius should be a pretty interesting fight because Darius is not a great technical striker. The fight might not hit the ground, but I would be surprised if Darius can get it down there. And if he does, does the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu just kind of cancel out and Darius sits on top. BJ Penn, I argue, in his prime, was a better boxer than Darius. So actually, I can see a prime BJ Penn beating Benil Darius. I can see it, but it's kind of 50-50 for me. I think Dustin destroys him. Justin Gaethje destroys him. Charles Oliveira destroys him. Islam Makhachev just no diffs him completely. Aldo in the top 10 of the featherweight division. He beats Bryce Mitchell, beats Mavsar Evloev, beats Giga Shikadze because of that cardio issue crazy that there's someone with worse cardio than Jose Aldo in the featherweight top 10. I think he beats Kelvin Cater. The leg kicks, the leg kicks will be a little too much. But the only thing about prime Jose Aldo was that he stopped throwing leg kicks for a lot of his fights. Even though he has them in his arsenal, I don't even know if he would throw them, even though he should against someone like Kelvin Cater. Boxing wise, Cater can give Aldo a lot of issues. I think he beats Josh Emmett. I think he beats Tapuria because of the leg kicks, stops the takedowns, trades a lot in the boxing. The boxing could be very interesting, but one of Jose Aldo's best techniques was that counter left hook. And we know Ilya Tapuria opens himself up for the counter left hook specifically that Josh Emmett. Emmett was even landing on him. If Josh Emmett's landing down on Taporia, you best know Jose Aldo is. So I do think Jose Aldo would beat Taporia. Stylistically, it's not a good fight for Taporia, man. I think he beats Arnold Allen overall, beats Brian Ortega. The only thing Ortega has is if he just outscraps Aldo. Like he's just too durable, keeps going forward, trades shots and drops Aldo and uses his cardio as a weapon. That's also the thing with Arnold Allen. Allen would have to use his cardio as a weapon against Aldo. That's actually the best way to beat Aldo, generally speaking. If you don't have some kind of like attribute advantage, height, reach, strength, speed, stuff like that, being more durable than Aldo while using your cardio as a weapon is generally the best way to beat this guy. You might take a lot of shots, but you're most likely going to gas him out and finish him. Ortega can possibly be one of those guys, but I would ultimately pick Aldo. Yair Rodriguez. I would pick Aldo. He's better fundamentally. If he sticks in the pocket with Yair, he will land a lot of big shots. The only thing about Yair, again, quite durable, good cardio. He's so much bigger, and those head kicks could be super devastating. So Yair definitely has a way to win this, but mostly, I think Aldo has a better chance of winning. I think Max Holloway beats him, and I think Volkanovski beats him. Dominic Cruz against the Bantamweight Top 10. He's actually in the Top 10, which is funny. He's the only divisional GOAT that is still in the Top 10 of his weight class. He's number nine. 
So I think he beats Pedro Munoz. He beats Rob Font. I think he loses Song Yedong. Song Yedong's takedown defense is a little too good. He's too explosive. He's so much faster. And I think Cruz will run into some big punches, man. Stylistically, this is one of his tougher fights. I think he beats Cheeto in a decision. The only thing about Cheeto is most fights he's going to be losing on the scorecards. It's just, can he catch you? So he could still potentially catch Cruz, but I think a prime dominant Cruz would win this by a decision. He would not be as chinny as he is right now or as he was when he fought Cheeto. Less wear and tear on the body, way more skilled, way faster at his physical peak. Technically speaking, he's better than ever. Yeah, I think he would beat Cheeto. I think Peter Jan beats him, but this guy, I don't know, man. He's so passive sometimes. He kind of just doesn't do what he needs to do sometimes. So I think the fight IQ definitely goes to Dominic Cruz's side, which could get him the win here. It's just hard to see on paper Dominic Cruz beat him, but game plans is a big thing. And I think Dominic Cruz could find something to beat Petrion, and I would not be surprised at that. But I ultimately will pick Petrion. I think Corey Sanigan beats him. I think Cejudo still beats Dominic Cruz. The takedowns are not going to be a thing for Cruz at all. And he's going to try to outstrike Cejudo. I don't know if that works for him. Dominic Cruz does his best work when he's landing light kicks and mixing up his striking with his wrestling. He can't do that against Cejudo. Cejudo is probably the toughest fight for Dominic Cruz in the whole division. Marab Davalashvili. I think Marab outwrestles him. Cruz was a crazy good scrambler, but I don't think he gets out of the grip of Marab. I don't think he gets out of the grip of Marab. I think Eljamay Sterling wins. I think he's better on the ground than Cruz. And he's also bigger than Cruz. He has a longer reach. He would probably get Cruz to the ground, where I don't think Cruz wants to get Sterling to the ground. And ultimately, I think Sterling wins that through a decision. I think Dominic Cruz beats Sean O'Malley. There's no way he stops the the mix-ups of wrestling and striking. He would try to snipe Cruz, which he can do. It's kind of the same thing with Cheeto, right? I can see Sean O'Malley catching him, but if they fought 10 times, does Sean O'Malley catch him more often than Cruz beats him? I don't think so. That was a really fun question. They went to the worst box. Which of the USC Divisional GOATs, DJ, Cruz, Aljo, Aldo, Volk, Habib, GSP, Silva, Adesanya, Jones, and Stipe, has some of the most embarrassing losses in their careers that really shook their legacy. I'm thinking all the losing to McGregor and GSP losing to Sarah as some of them. Also, your videos are always fun to watch. I never get tired of them. Keep going, bro. Thank you so much for the question, man. And it's an interesting one. So embarrassing losses that shook their legacy. Number one is all the losing to McGregor. 13 second knockout against a guy who berated him for months, trash talks, press conferences, world tours, making a fool of Aldo. I mean, a lot of guys respected Aldo, maybe not as much as they should have because they never wanted to consider him one of the greatest. Even still, they don't for some odd reason. But people did have respect for Jose Aldo and McGregor to come around and make a fool of him for so long and then knock him out in 13 seconds. A guy who ruled the division for, what, seven years? Nine title defenses, looked like nobody was going to beat this guy. That literally shook up Aldo's legacy to the core. GSP losing to Sarah was crazy, but we do have to know that GSP was not in his prime. That was a very young GSP. He should not have lost to the guy freshly coming off the Ultimate Fighter. But it's not like Aldo, right? So he didn't lose as fast. He did get destroyed by Sarah, but he also was not in his prime. Other losses. I think Dominic Cruz getting schooled by Cody Garbrandt was pretty crazy. And it's more embarrassing now considering where Cody Garbrandt is. It just, it just goes to show you some guys were trained to specifically beat a certain fighter. Cody Garbrandt was bred and fed to beat Dominic Cruz, and he did that easily. He literally looked like he was Dominic Cruz's kryptonite. He was dancing in front of him, knocking him down, taking him to the ground. He beat Dominic Cruz everywhere. We've never seen anybody do that before. The only reason why people don't look at it as maybe that embarrassing is for the fact that, number one, Dominic Cruz was riddled with injuries throughout his entire career. And number two, he took the loss very well. His press conference, I think painted that loss in a different light because of how well he took it. But considering your question here, yes, looking at the fight itself and now looking where Cody Garbrandt is, I think it's one of the more embarrassing losses out of those fighters. Obviously, Habib never lost, so he cannot be counted at all. Silva's loss to Wyman, I don't know if you would count that as an embarrassing loss, the first one that is. Actually, both of them, because people create a lot of excuses, right? Silva was fooling around. He wasn't taking the fight seriously the first time. He was actually doing pretty well too, landing very good leg kicks, constantly taunting Weidman and got caught doing so. It's embarrassing the way he got knocked out, but not embarrassing of the whole dynamic of the fight, right? People said if Silva was serious, he should have won. The second fight, he was serious, but then Weidman broke his leg from a check. It almost felt like those fights never were completed for a lot of fans. So I don't know if I would consider those some of the more embarrassing losses. Adesanya losing to Pereira is not embarrassing at all. Him losing to Strickland. Do you think that's worse than the GSP lost to Matt Serra? So the odds were like similar. Matt Serra to beat GSP was similar to Sean Strickland beating Adesanya. I think actually 
Strickland's was worse, right? He was a bigger underdog than Matt Serra was. Look at the other factors of those fights. Adesanya was in his prime. GSP was not. And Strickland dominated Adesanya for five rounds. He didn't knock him out in the first. I can argue getting dominated and schooled, manhandled for five rounds is worse than getting knocked out in the first, right? It's a lot more humiliating. So that is actually one of the more embarrassing losses, in my opinion. I mean, Jones losing to Matt Hamill, man, that's pretty embarrassing. No, I'm just kidding. None of Stipe's losses were embarrassing outside of the Stefan Struve loss, because that should not have happened. I guess it's heavyweight. You know, stuff happens. Volk never lost in the featherweight division. Aljo losing to Sean O'Malley. Is that embarrassing? Not necessarily. He got caught. It happens. We saw a lot of champions and fighters get caught, and he won the first round too. So it wasn't like he was getting dominated or something like that. He rushed and got countered by a very good striker. And DJ losing to Cejudo is absolutely not embarrassing at all. That fight was very close. Even still to this day, a lot of people think DJ won. So that's probably the least embarrassing loss. Then we go to Daniel Lopez. Hey Weasel, love your stuff. Thank you so much, man. Over the last two years, I've noticed a huge amount of new content creators entering the UFC scene. I noticed more people watch independent creators like yourself over actual UFC fighter channels. How far do you think the scene will expand? And what are some of your favorite channels? This is a very good question. This is a question I don't get asked too often. I've seen a lot of channels come and go. I've seen a lot of channels still stick around and do amazing content. So how far do I think the scene will expand? I think it can grow a lot more, man. The MMA content creating scene from YouTube to TikTok to Instagram, everywhere, right? It's still very open. It's still kind of empty. There's a lot of space for a lot more content creators. There's not a lot of them, man. Even though they're growing, there's more now. Look at the other niches or communities of just general online content. MMA is very small. It can grow so much more. I think collaborations are going to be big, which rises all tides, right? I've talked about this before on Twitter. I do not understand why so many MMA content creators want to attack each other in such a small space. Well, actually, I do understand. It's for your own self-growth, right? You just think about yourself growing, but there's a cap, right? If the whole community does not grow, there's a cap. There's always going to be a cap. But until the whole community grows, that cap is going to stay where it's at and nobody's going to break it. There's been a couple content creators that have gotten on the trending page, right? There's a couple content creators that's gotten a couple million views and stuff like that in their videos, but it's never a consistent thing. I try to do my best to get as many fans involved in MMA as possible to pick up the sport. And I think during the whole pandemic, I try to do that even more than ever before. I saw it as an opportunity to raise the entire community itself, right? And I see it almost like a responsibility for myself to try to get more fans into the sport as I can. In doing so, I'm also helping all the other content creators because if they start watching my content, they're going to watch other content. They're going to discover other people, right? They're going to discover Mixed Molly Whoppery who I think is one of the best content creators in MMA. They're going to watch Mujahid, right? You got comedy videos there. You can watch Luke Thomas, right? Good Analyst has his own show and stuff like that. You can look at some of the smaller guys. You can look at the other fighters, right? Some of the other fighters are going to discover, like Jamal Hill's YouTube channel. And through that, the community grows itself. So I think there's a lot of content to be made about MMA. And I try my best to do other kinds of content, right? I don't just do analysis, which most people know me by. I do prediction videos. I do podcasts. I do original content like nightmare matchups and prospects. And I try to give a spotlight on a lot of fighters that fans don't know about, right? I talked about Taito Ivasa back in the day before almost nobody knew who that guy was. I talked about Alex Pereira when he first came into the UFC, before he made his UFC debut. And I did get a lot of comments from, from a lot of fans that I was the one that introduced them to Alex Pereira. And I'm very happy to see there's a lot more content creators who are doing their own kind of thing, you know, expand the content, make diverse content, you know, try different things and make it fun and interesting for the audience. It's what I've tried to do. And I hope to see a lot of other content creators go by a similar kind of game plan. Because when I started, there was only like a few content creators. There weren't many of them, man. You could probably count on two hands how many independent content creators were out there in 2017. Now there's a lot more and it's only going to grow. For a guy who's been around for a long time, I am so happy to see that. And I I'm down to collaborate with a lot of other content creators. Expanding the content and make it as interesting as possible, I think is the best way to expand the online scene for more fans to get involved. Because online is the way most fans are going to get involved, right? But what are some of my favorite channels? My favorite to watch is Mixed Molly Whoppery. That guy makes excellent videos, almost like documentaries. I think Anatomy of a Fighter is pretty good too. I think Luke Thomas is excellent. I've been watching that guy even before I was making videos. So those are my favorite channels. I'm also starting to like Jamal Hill's channel too. And then we go to Ellen Combs. Dear Wise Weasel, after hearing your reaction to the Strickland vs. Adesanya press conference, 
I had a question for you. If you had to make a main card for a pay-per-view UFC event, not based on the fights, but based on how good the press conference beforehand would be, what matchups would be on that card? Thanks, love the content. Interesting question, man. So we know for a fact you have to have Sean Strickland on there. You're going to have to have Conor McGregor on there. You're going to have to have Adesanya and Drickus fighting. So you would have Sean Strickland versus Paulo Costa. I think there'll be a lot of good trash talking there. Adesanya versus Drickus because of the drama. Conor McGregor versus Islam Makashev because you know Habib is going to be there. Colby Covington versus Dustin Poirier because you know Hori is going to be out there too. Volkanovski and Taporia look like they have a lot to say to each other in a press conference. So I would definitely have them two on. And Sean O'Malley and Cheeto. That would be the greatest press conference ever. You got Conor and Islam and Habib about the scrap. You have Sean Strickland clowning on Paulo Costa. Paulo Costa being funny himself. Adesanya and Drick is just... They're going to go a whole different direction that's not really politically correct. Cheeto's going to be telling O'Malley how he's going to kill him the whole time. They're going to be talking about that leg kick and the perennial nerve for like 10 minutes. Volkanovski and Taporia, straight up competition. I'm going to knock you out. It's going to be easy. There's going to be a lot of good trash talk between them two as well. Colby and Dustin. I mean, Colby's going to let off on Dustin. And Dustin's going to be like... Dustin's going to give out some like zingers, right? A couple one-line. Colby's gonna bring up Jorge, he's gonna be bringing up Dustin, the American Top Team gym, how he's gonna beat another American Top Team fighter, how he ruled that gym, he was the king over there and all that stuff, he's gonna be saying a whole bunch of stuff, that would be such an insane press conference man. And then last question, we're gonna go to Joseph DeSalt, you've discussed before that Wonderboy striking is still one of the most elite in MMA, this got me thinking, what are your all time MMA pound for pound striker rankings, guys like Anderson Silva, Israel Adesanya, Alex Pereira, etc. And also, where do guys like Steven Thompson and Cedric Dumbay fit into the mix? Very interesting question. So the best strikers pound for pound in MMA. It's hard to consider where Cedric is at right now, but the guy I can only imagine is like top 10 for sure. So I would say, does this have to be in order? That makes it a lot harder. I think in the top 10, you're going to have Anderson Silva, Israel Adesanya, Alex Pereira, Wonderboy, Sean O'Malley, Max Holloway, Pietro Jan, Corey Sanhagen, Cedric Dumbe and Alexander Volkanovsky. So where in the mix would Wonderboy be? I think Wonderboy is top five. It's hard to say Cedric Dumbe, but off of what I see, I think he's on the lower end of the top 10 for now. I could be completely wrong. Maybe he gets knocked out by Stevie Ray or something. I don't know. Oh man, these are some good questions though. I'd want to move on. And then the last question, we're going to go to Omsol Hagia. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. Hi, Weasel. More of a personal question, but what made you interested in combat sports? Thanks. Keep up the good work. Thank you so much, man. Yeah, I'm always, even for personal questions, I'm always up to answer them. What got me interested in combat sports? So combat sports is more of a general thing. I've been training since I was a little kid. My dad put me in Taekwondo when I was like four years old. And I used to train with uh, the adults because we used to come late to class. The kids' classes were earlier in the day than the adults were after. And because we came so late, they made us train with the adults constantly. So I wasn't good back then, but I became much better as I got older. And I still have the kicking dexterity. Some of you guys probably seen uh, one of my Instagram videos of me kicking the bag. I do have very good kicking dexterity. I'm very flexible. I have very powerful kicks because I developed as a human throwing kicks. So my introduction to combat sports was through my dad putting me in Taekwondo. He didn't want me to get in trouble. That's why he did that. It was actually more for my my other sibling because my other sibling was getting into some stuff, man. You know, my dad tried his best to put him in combat sports in order to get away from that sort of life. And because of that, he also put me there too. So I don't follow that same path that my sibling was going down. I was more serious in combat sports though than anybody else in my family. As soon as they put me in there, I wanted to go to boxing after. So I went into boxing in my, I forgot how old I was, before teens. I was like 10 or 11 or something like that. I started boxing and I was boxing for what, five, six or seven years up until I went to college. I stopped combat sports because I thought I had to focus on schoolwork, right? I didn't know what college was going to be like, but then it turned out to be even easier than high school. So I made time and went to MMA, did that for several years. Wrestling is still one of my weak points, but I've really gotten better at everything else. Now, what introduced me to MMA specifically is a little bit different. This is after I was doing Taekwondo training and right where I started getting into boxing, my cousins introduced me to MMA. It'd actually be really cool if I bring them on for one of my podcast episodes, talk about a bunch of stuff. Because like two days ago, we were talking everything about MMA. One of them is still very much in tune with what's going on in the sport. The guy that introduced me to MMA, bring him onto the podcast. So when I was like nine or 10, I was at my cousin's house. We spent a lot of time over there after my dad died. Literally every single day we were there. 
I think my mom did that to try to get our minds off all that stuff and just have fun as kids because we were just kids, you know? Well, they showed me BJ Penn, and I still remember exactly how they explained it to me. They would go, yo, you got to see this. These guys are fighting. I'm like, wait, like WWF? Like Stone Cold Steve Austin? No, like actual fighting. Like these guys are throwing punches and knocking each other out. I was confused because when I was a kid, I thought pro wrestling was real fighting. They said like, there's this one Hawaiian guy, right? He looks like he doesn't know how to fight. If you saw him, he looks like he's just some regular guy. But he's a savage. He's so strong and fast and he knocks these bigger guys out. I'm like, wait, I got to see this. So they showed me a highlight reel way back in the day, like where YouTube was a few years after it started. Then they had one of the, I think, early UFC video games and stuff. And we were playing that and they're telling me, look, it's Tito Ortiz and this guy, he's like a good wrestler and stuff like that. It got me really interested. And then eventually, like a few years later... They were showing me Matt Hughes fights and stuff. I never really liked Matt Hughes fighting style even back in the day. Not too much of my thing. I was always more interested in striking. And then they showed me Anderson Silva. That's where it kind of hooked me. When I saw Anderson Silva, I was like, okay, this is what I like. I love the way this guy fights. And then, so I started getting familiar with the names of Fedor, Tito Ortiz, Chuck Liddell, Vanderlei Silva, BJ Penn. These are the first fighters I ever even knew. And then in 2011... This is in lead up to the Anderson Silva and Vitor Belfort fight. This was the fight that made me a hardcore fan because there was a big argument. I didn't even know what to really say because I didn't know anything about Vitor. They used to tell me like he blitzed down Vanderlei back in the day because I knew who Vanderlei was. He knocked out Vanderlei in like 30 seconds or whatever. I'm like, wait, so that guy's really good, huh? I think Anderson though is amazing. You guys think he's going to be Anderson? And these guys are like, yeah, man, he has really good boxing. He's very powerful and fast. He might be faster than Anderson. There were so many like debates between my cousins and my friends about the Anderson and Vitor fight. We're all very young. Then I started looking up highlight reels of Vitor. And I knew this is my first time analyzing a fight. Anderson versus Vitor. I looked up highlights of Vitor. It's the first time I ever did this. And I said, there's no way this guy beats Anderson. There's no way. I've been boxing a little bit. I did Taekwondo and stuff. I understood a a little bit of the striking game. Even when I was very young, I understood like some things that other people would not understand. And I said, there's no way he can get in on Anderson and knock him out. I think Anderson will beat this guy. And when Anderson pulled off the front kick, which I did not expect, it made me an instant hardcore fan. I'm diving in on this. I'm going to watch every single other fight. I have probably missed only on one hand fight cards. Ever since that time in 2011. I think after that, Michael Bisping fought Jorge Rivera. Jorge Rivera, the whole trash talking. Rivera's making those videos mocking Michael Bisping and stuff. Michael Bisping finishes him. I remember Mark Munoz destroying CB Dalloway after. And I believe the next pay-per-view card was John Jones versus Shogun. And honestly, I didn't know too much about John Jones. I never seen him fight before. The commentators and some of the YouTube videos, people talk about how John Jones is a real deal. He might actually beat Shogun. But I was very familiar with Shogun after watching his highlight reel. And I was like, wait, really? John Jones could beat this guy? That's going to be crazy, man. And he goes and destroys him. I think this is also around the time Brennan Schaub knocked out Mirko Krokop. Because I did watch The Ultimate Fighter with Brennan Schaub, Kimbo, Roy Nelson, all those guys. Yeah, so that was my introduction to uh, MMA. Makes me miss it, man. I miss the old days. But I do think MMA now is way better. I want to go through more questions, man. But I have to cut it there. Really good questions, guys. Very fun episode. I hope you guys enjoyed it as well. And if you did, make sure to give this a like. Make sure to subscribe. Hit the bell for notifications. Don't forget that. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Which is probably going to be the predictions for this weekend's card.